Thanks, Lauren. So here we are, second week of this Creator series. And the goal was pretty simple. We seek a relationship with God. And well, like any relationship, before you can enter into that relationship, you have to get to know the person that you're about to relate to, commit to. In our society, when it comes to those kind of relationships that we want to eventually enter in a marriage relationship with, we call that process dating. It's kind of where you're just kind of get to know one another. You're just trying to figure out, do we fit? Then um, after a while of dating and you decide, yeah, this kind of is cool, this is working, you get married and then you figure out that's when things start to get complicated because you really didn't know the person. Um, you got to know about the person, but it isn't until you actually live with the person that you really get to know that person. Now, in this relationship with God, we need to understand God already knows us. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 24 says, This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, who formed you in the womb. I am the Lord, the maker of all things, who stretches out the heavens, who spins out the earth by myself. So there's some good news, and that is I am not a mystery to God. God completely knows what he's getting. Um, the bad news is, is I'm not a mystery to God. God knows what he's getting. So what that means to me is the good is I will never surprise God. There is absolutely nothing I can do that God says, wow, that was a plot twist. I didn't see that one coming. God knows me that well that, that I don't get the benefit of surprising him. And that's good. But I'm, huh, the bad is I also can't hide anything from God. From the beginning, mankind has been trying to hide from God, and well, God is just too good at the game of hide and seek, and he sees and knows everything. Now, while God knows me, the thing is I come to the conclusion that there are often times in my spiritual relationship, I'm not always sure I know what I'm getting. Now, here's what I mean by this. This is what um, Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 5. But when it comes, I mean, as you, do, as you do not know the path of the wind or how the body is formed in the mother's womb, so you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things. So the problem with me knowing God isn't the fact that God isn't trying really hard to make himself known. The problem is, is that, believe it or not, there are many times in my life I'm clueless. I don't get it. God has made it pretty evident, but ask my wife. Sometimes you have to explain things to me very slowly, um, or I miss the point. And I think a lot of times we do that with God. So um, what we have been attempting to do this year is to kind of take a moment, be still, quiet in our minds, quiet in our lives, quiet in our hearts, take all the things that seem to swirl around me and distract me and push them out of my head and just be still and know that I'm God. Figure out who this God person is. And so we spent the first six months just talking about how to be still. And now we're taking the second six months with learning how to know God. And to do that, we've gone all the way back to the beginning, and that's where this Creator series comes from. And this morning, we're going to start off with this term. Chaotic creation. Chaotic. Just bear with me for just a minute. You see, because when me, the human, begins to look at creation, here is what I know. I know absolutely God created it, thus it's his. Okay? This is not my creation. I didn't dream up how a bee's supposed to fly, and I didn't dream up how a bird's supposed to sing, and I didn't dream up how all that this was all God's creation and he did so according to Genesis in six days and then on the seventh day it says he rested now a lot of time I look at that and I think well that means God must have went on vacation because that when I rest that's what it means and the problem is is that God went on vacation 
and he left his messy kids in charge. And well, the kids did what the kids do, and the kids made a mess. So God had to come home and clean up the mess. This is what Genesis chapter 3, verses 21 through 24. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work in the ground from which he had been taken and drove, them out, and drove out the man. And he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. And so God came home and he cleaned up the mess that man had made and he put man out of the garden and he put the watchdogs in place. And quite honestly, sometimes I look at it and I say, well, then God went back on vacation. And, and God went on vacation for a while until we get to this guy named Noah in chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. And, well, God comes back and takes a look at what he says. And he says, oh, my gosh, we have a wicked problem now. Um, Genesis chapter 6, 5 through 6. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth. And everything and every inclination and thought of human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted he had made human beings on the earth. And his heart was deeply troubled. God looked at the world and said, this is getting downright disgusting. And maybe it should scare us that he even for a moment said, you know what, I'm kind of sorry I did this human man race thing. It just doesn't seem to be working out. But fortunately, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 7, God said, I got a solution. He gave the world a good old-fashioned bath. And he washed it all nice and clean. And then... um. Just as you just kind of think about it from a human perspective, it seems like God left again. And as I read through the Old Testament and I begin to look, it just kind of looks like God is coming and going. And he comes and he sees, oh my gosh, everything's gotten a mess. And so he raises up a hero or he raises up a biblical character or he puts something in place and he tries to fix the problem. And then after God said, that's good, it looks like God goes off again. He just keeps coming and going until one day he finally says enough is enough and I'm going to clean up this mess permanently and I'm going to send my son Jesus. And Jesus enters into humanity and he lived for 33 years and he, he was in the grave for three days and when he rose he walked on the earth for 40 days and then when that was all done, guess what Jesus said? I'll be back. This is what he said in Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 10. After he said this, he was taken up before the very eyes, and a cloud hid him from the sight. They were looking intently up on the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who had been taken from you into the heaven will come back in the same way he left, in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So Jesus came, he lived, he died, and he left. And now here we are, and well, we're waiting for him to come back. And in the process, um, he, spent, he sent this spirit guy and put apart this thing that we call the church together. And he said, we're going to let them be kind of the people that take care of the earth now. And quite honestly, sometimes I look at the planet these days, and I look at the headlines, and I'm thinking, this ain't working, God. Um, I don't know that we're up to the task. I mean, God, don't you think this would work better if you just stay put? I mean, wouldn't all this be fixed if, if, if you just stayed right here and, and you just looked over everything all the time? And a lot of times that is how I see God. You say, well, you're the preacher. You're not supposed to see God that way. I'm a human. I struggle with God because I want God to be here and present all the time. And you know what? That's the second thing we see from creation. God is indeed present. I hope you just took that little rendition that I just gave you is exactly what it was. It was sarcasm. God did not go on vacation. God is not coming and going. God is not saying, well, yeah, you guys figure it out for right now. When you mess it all up, I'll come back and clean up the mess you created. God is not an absent-minded God. God is forever present in our society. And you know, um, God is never going to be the come-and-go God. That's not the way that God 
works. You see, he is ever present in our life. He was absolutely, positively, all present at the beginning of time. Remember these verses? We read them last week. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And I put those words in yellow because I want you to see that when it came to me and my side of the relationship, God had some words for me. Formless, empty, dark, I didn't exist. But it says God was there. Not only was God there, a lot of times we forget God was all present when he became the creator of the universe. This is what it says right there in Genesis chapter 2. It says that God created. The word that we see God there is Elohim, which usually associates with God the Father. As you continue reading down the the verse there, it says, and the spirit of God hovered above the, the waters. And that is actually that word spirit there is the word that we get wind or breath. Then we begin to tie in John chapter 1, verse 3, and it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was, excuse me, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. So you get the picture here that we have God the Father, we'll call him the mouth, and then we have God the Holy Spirit, that's the breath. And then you have God the Son, that's Jesus. And that's the Word. And how did God make creation? It says he spoke it into existence. God was all in on this creation idea. And he was all ready for us. You see, God is and always will be present in creation. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on wicked and the good. So that means God sees the good in me and the bad in me. His eyes are everywhere. Honestly, that scares me. Um, You guys know I have a secular job, and the secular job that I have, I work for a company that we collect data. We collect legal data, and we collect data on everybody. Um, It's kind of what our company does. And we collect data that a lot of people are probably scared to know what gets collected sometimes because the data, it's everywhere. You realize God is bigger than that because when God sees, he sees past, present, and future all at the same time. Collectively, he has all of the information. And um, a lot of times, I'm not sure we believe this. You see, I think most of us, deep down inside, want to believe in the coming of God. Now, why do I think that? It's called reality. You see, I grew up, and both of my parents worked. Okay? So, so that meant that in, as we got older and they no longer had babysitters or decided to hire people to kind of watch over us, there came a point in time when my parents went to work, and they left Melanie, Wanda, and Barry home alone. Yeah, you're laughing because you know if you're a parent, this is going to end badly. And, and, and you know, the funny thing is, when you ask my parents about our childhood, I'm going to be careful because they might be watching. I might be making some confessions here. But anyway, when you ask my parents about our childhood, how my parents perceived their house is vastly different than what their house looked like when their parents weren't there. Okay? I mean... My parents perceived it as we always colored inside the lines, and my sisters and I know when the mice are wet, when the cat's away, the mice will play, and sometimes we didn't even have a piece of paper. We were just like sometimes very chaotic in the way that we do things. And you know, that's what we convince ourselves with God. If I can convince myself that God is a come and go God, that there are moments in time that God aren't looking, then you know what? That leaves me in charge of my house. And since God is away, I can do this any way that I want. I can make this up as I go. And so when we truly get back to the point that God is not only a powerful God, he is an ever-present God, now I got questions. Because if God is so present, 
here. Why are things so bad? Why are there shootings and killings and things in the world that are happening? God, if you're here and you're watching and you can see what I can see, only you can see it, why is evil so rampant? I mean, you can't even read the newspaper these days without getting depressed. Why, God? I mean, God, if you're watching, why don't you do something about this? Lord, are you not looking? This is your house. It's your design. God, clean it up. Don't we get in this mode sometimes? I do. You see, I convince myself that God can't possibly see what's going on because if God really could see what I see, then you know what? I'm motivated to want to do something about it. Surely a holy, righteous, just God who is all-knowing, he would be able to do something to fix this mess that's been created. And so I put God into a box. Either I have to take away his power, he can't fix it, Or I have to take away his presence. He just doesn't care because he's not looking. I get that way sometimes. Obviously, God just doesn't care. He's not paying attention. So now I want to take it and let you understand why this works the way it does. And to do that, guess what? All the way back to the beginning of creation. Because, you know, when God created, we think about those six days. We think that he created some light, and he created the sun, and he created beaches, and he created mountains, and he created all these wonderful creatures, and he created all the wonderful vegetables, and all the wonderful trees, and even the tree that we aren't supposed to talk about, which we'll talk about here in a minute. And then, well, he created all, and then he created us. You know, that's not all he created. There's some concepts that he created in those six days that we need to be aware of, because when he created these concepts, It explains everything about why God is always present and why we see the world the way it is. What's the first thing God created? Well, in his presence, God created this thing called freedom. This is what it says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then the Lord said, Let us make mankind in our image and in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. God desired a relationship not a pet. And to have somebody to relate to, he physically had to create mankind in his own image. And to do that, he had to give humanity free will, the ability to choose. But for them to be truly free, then he had to turn the keys to the house over to them. My wife and I are going on a trip later this week, and I am pleased to say my sons, although I love them very much and I think they're great kids, they ain't going to be home for four days without mom and dad there. Um, I love them, but I'm not insane. They're going to take their own little trip um, because I'd like my house to still have four walls standing with a roof over it when I come back. That's just the way it works. I would, I'm not to that point yet. Maybe someday. I'm not to that point, because here's what I know. I give them the authority. I also know I've given them all freedom because they're free. They're free to make their own choices. And with those two things in place, um, God then created something that, honestly, I don't know that I would have gone this way, but this is why I'm not God. God created this thing called choice. This is what it says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from all the tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. You know, we're really big into trying to pass laws and to make people do the right thing. And this verse right here, if it tells you something else, you can't do that. How many rules did they get? One. How complicated was it? Don't eat that. That's it. All of the hundreds of trees around that were growing all of these pretty fruits and all of this delicious fruits and bananas and oranges and strawberries and blueberries and grapes and probably some things that we don't even have on this planet anymore, all of that was available to them. And he had one tree 
That's it, just one. And he said, don't eat that. That's a pretty simple command, isn't it? I think even I can figure out how to do that one. <sighs> but it didn't work that way, did it? See, the reality is, is man didn't kind of do what he wanted. God said, I'm going to give you choice. And man said, choose me. And maybe you want to think, well, God was just sitting humanity up for a fall. No. God was giving them something to think about. Choose me. You see, because when God created choice, he also created this idea of love. If I take away your freedom and I take away your choice, then guess what? I take away your ability to love. There has to be, that's the way it works. You has to be a balance in that, that when you have freedom, you have choice, then you can have love. If I take it all away, it doesn't work. And so God was simply putting it out there and saying, humanity that I wish to have a relationship with, choose me. Choose me. <sighs> See, because in the absence of choice, there is no love. God wanted us to love him. And I'm sure as God watched things unfold, being a parent, I know he desperately wanted to put it all in motion. I am quite sure that as humanity stretched out their hand for the, tra the knowledge of good and evil, God was so badly wanted to say, don't eat that. Didn't you hear what I said? It's bad for you. I'm sure God wanted to maybe put a bigger sign up there. Maybe he should have put that flaming sword up there before they ate. But again, if I take away your choice, if I take away your love, and so God could only do one thing. Watch. Parents, you ever watched your kids make bad mistakes before? And you just have to know, I just have to sit back and let them do it. And hopefully they don't burn the house there in the process. That's all you can do. Sometimes you have to let them make their choices and make their decisions. And then when they're all done making their choices and making their decisions and their life is a mess, well, then we get to show the other aspect of God's presence because out of our poor choices, God showed his love. Out of those poor choices, how easy would it have been for God to say after Adam and Eve had eaten of the fruit and after Adam and Eve had done the things they had done, for God to look at them and say, I told you not to do that, I'm done. Look, I'm just going to wipe the slate clean now and start over and we'll just start from square one again. How easy could that have been for God? Remember, we talked about it last week. He doesn't have an absence of power. He very easily could have wiped the slate clean at that point and said, I'm just going to do this again, and we'll try again, and we'll just keep trying until we get it right. But you do understand, God couldn't do that because, again, he had created his, for his, his relationship. And the second that he kept wiping it out and wiping it out and wiping it out and starting over and starting over and starting over, then what, we would have real, what God would have originally had to come to the conclusion is that, you know what? It doesn't work that way. If I'm going to truly have a relationship, I'm going to truly have to let them be free. I'm going to truly have to give them complete choice. At some point in their life, they're going to make a bad choice. And at that point, I've got to figure out how I'm going to deal with that bad choice. And the answer can't always be destroy it all and start over. God had to create something else for this to work. God had to create an idea of redemption. Listen to John chapter 1, verses 6, 16 through 18. Out of, the, out of his fullness, we have all received grace, in place of grace already given. For the law was not given through Moses, and grace and, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the, only, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is in the closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. So here's the way God had to solve his quandary. If I take away their choice, if I take away their freedom, then I take away their ability to love. And then I take away their ability to be in a relationship with me. 
So the only thing I can do to fix the poor choice that you've made is I have to give you something else. I have to give you a way back. And as we turn through the Old Testament, and we'll take a big walk through this in just a few weeks, as we turn through the Old Testament, we'll see that God set up all of this sacrificial system and all of these things that were going on that trying to, to give humanity an understanding of what it meant to come back to God. And we saw exactly how much that failed because they couldn't do that right either. They still made bad choices. And so God sent his son Jesus, and he came. And he made God known to humanity, not by some God way up there that isn't there. He became human and dwelled here on this planet. And it says he did so perfectly without sin. I can't imagine that. My brain doesn't wrap into the no sin moment. But I understand that's what God said Jesus did. He lived here, no sin. And then it says he gave his life. He allowed himself to be nailed to a cross and crucified for my sin. Not because he was guilty of anything. He became the ultimate sacrificial lamb to God's redemption plan. And they placed him in a grave and then he rose and when he whispered those words, I'll be back, he wasn't saying I'm leaving you. You know what he's really saying? Choose me. Choose me. We're, we're all the way back where we were at the moment of creation when Adam and Eve were standing there and they were staring at that tree of the knowledge of good and evil and they're saying, that looks delicious. Yeah, I know God said don't eat that, but it looks so delicious. And they stretched out their hand and they ate of it and they made their own choice. Instead of choosing God, they chose their own way. And what God did when he sent Jesus, he put us back at square one without destroying it all. But you do understand something, right? That means freedom, choice, still exists. And as I look out in the world today, you know what? I absolutely see some very bad decisions being made. I see bad choices. And sometimes it takes every fiber of my being not to want to go out there and say, Will you listen? These are bad decisions. Just listen. But I know it's not going to work that way. I can't legislate somebody's morality. I can't make you be good. I cannot force you to be good because what do I have to do to force you to make good? What do I have to take away? I have to take away your freedom. We experienced that last year when we had all the regulations about what we could do and couldn't do and how far we had to stand apart and whether you had to wear a mask or not. We had all of these things. And what was the big cry that you heard from all the people? You're infringing upon my freedom. You're right, they were. And what did the people say? Well, we're doing this for your own good. And we had this big battle going on. You realize that's the battle that we face every day in our life when it comes to our relationship with God. God says, choose me. And when you choose me, I will be ever-present in your life, which means that there's going to be some things in your life that will change. But you do understand, it's still your choice. You have to choose God. God is here. If you are waiting for God to do some other miraculous thing to convince you that he's here, he's already done it. He came, he died, he gave his life, he rose. What else do you want him to do? Now the question is, where are you? Do you know that's the first question God asked humanity after they made the poor choice? The comical scene, Adam and Eve out there trying to sew some fig leaves together to cover themselves, to make themselves acceptable to God. And when they figured out they couldn't get the leaves to stay together, they hid, and it says God showed up there he was, walking in the cool of the day, and he said, Hey, Adam! Eve! Time for our evening walk! No answer. Instead of going back to heaven, he cried out, Hey, guys! Where are you? And that cry has made it all the way across all generations. Jesus said he came to seek and save the lost. Still crying out, Where are you? question is, is are you willing 
to accept his presence in your life each and every day. I ask the worship team to make their way back up here. Um, we aren't doing in